everyone, Franz Liss on behalf of the Great Plains Institute, and let me thank the Nicholas Institute has been our partners uh, on this PJM effort for hosting, especially the technology piece, which, you know, there's always a lot to deal with there. Um, so just to reiterate, there were just a few beeps. This is being recorded, the part of the presentation where we have the presentations. When we finish the presentations, we're going to unmute everyone and you can, and you can ask questions and make comments then. We're not going to record that part and that part will not be posted online. And that's because we want you to feel free to ask whatever you want and, and, and uh, share whatever comments you like. This is also states only. Um, we, uh, we were at, in Columbus together, PJM Environmental and Energy Regulators on September 28th and 29th, as you recall. Um, we had the workshop on the 28th and then we had our states only meeting on the 29th. And it was at that states only meeting that we, our, you know, iPhones and other devices were buzzing with the uh, news that the DOE directive had, had dropped. Um, and we said at that meeting that we would schedule a webinar to get to really uh, dig into this directive and try to understand what it means. Um, we also scheduled today to be before you have to file your comments on, on Monday. So the, the comments to FERC are due on Monday and then you'll have 15 days to reply to comments that, came, that come in next Monday, so by November 7th. Um, so that's why we're here today. And um, I'm gonna introduce the two speakers. We're really pleased these two guys are FERC watchers. So they're, you know, they're, they watch it on a daily, monthly, yearly basis and have for quite some time. You can go to the next slide, Amanda. We have Ari Pesco, who is a senior fellow in electricity law at Harvard Law School's environmental law program. Uh, and Har Ari is a, a former litigator with a large law firm and litigated on FERC issues. He also has a listserv, which I, I love. And if you're not on this listserv, get yourself on this list, listserv. You can go to statepowerproject.org um, to sign up. If not, get in touch with me. I'll forward one of his emails, and at the end, it tells you how to how to subscribe to the listserv. But um, speaking of FERC watching, you know, if there's a court decision or an order from FERC, Ari's sending out a, a missive on it, and it's always well informed and concise. Most importantly, concise. He's a smart guy, knows this stuff very well. Um, but what's most impressive is that he can really cut through the deep complexity of this stuff and get to the heart of it and, and give a nice, clear presentation. And you're about to see an example of that, I'm sure. And then we have Paul Sakevich. Um, I, I practiced so many times with Paul's help on his last name, so hopefully that was reasonably close. Paul is an economist, PhD, and uh, the president of his own consulting operation, E-Cubed Associates. Many of you know him as the former chief economist at PJM. Paul, and these two are, are, are a, a great duo because Paul is another smart guy who also has a gift for getting to the heart of things. And you always, you always sort of know where the issue is from Paul's perspective. You don't, you don't have to wait very long to hear it. So without further ado, we're gonna, we're gonna go to Ari first. Ari's gonna give his presentation. Then we'll have Paul give his. And if you have clarifying questions, again, as, as Sarah said, you can put them in the chat box during this time period when you're muted. Um, we're doing that because we're recording this. It's gonna be posted online for your colleagues who weren't able to make this time slot. Uh, so uh, with that, let's give Ari control of the screen. So during this presentation time, put your questions, your clarifying questions in the chat box. Sarah will spot them. And then once we unmute, you will be able to have a, a, a conversation and be able to talk to each other and you can ask your questions. It looks like you're ready to go, Ari. It's all yours. Great. Thanks, Franz. Um, so let me just start off by just um, a very brief introduction to the Harvard Environmental Policy Initiative, which is where I am. We are an independent policy organization that produces legal analysis on a range of environmental and energy issues. And I've put my email address here on this slide. And please feel free to be in touch about not just this DOE rule or proposed rule, um, but about um, you know, any of the other range of, of legal issues that I cover. And uh, thank you in particular, Franz, for that uh, 
excellent advertisement for our State Power Project uh, website and list. So this is what I'm going to talk about in my presentation. Um, start out just with, you know, exactly what DOE did here and its legal authority for doing so. Um, what does the NOPR itself actually say? Um, and then I'm going to talk about some, what I see as legal deficiencies or potential legal deficiencies in the notice of proposed rulemaking. Um, we filed a four-page comment yesterday that's now in the docket on one of these issues. And then I'm going to speculate on what might happen from this. Obviously, one possibility is that FERC um, simply approves the NOPR and it then uh, becomes effective, and there's, there's several other possibilities as well that I'll, that I'll discuss. So let's start with what happened on September 28th, 29th. Um, DOE invoked its authority under the DOE, uh, that should be Organization Act, um, which is the act of Congress in 1977 that created the Department of Energy. When Congress created the department, it provided it with authority to essentially step into the shoes of FERC and propose rules under um, either the uh, Natural Gas Act or the Federal Power Act. Um, DOE has rarely invoked this authority. Uh, it has not actually proposed a rule since 1985 when it proposed a rule uh, relating to the natural uh, gas industry. Um, and as far as I can tell, it's actually never proposed a rule under the Federal Power Act, so this is, is unprecedented here. Um, the last time DOE did invoke this authority was not to propose a rule, but rather to issue a uh, notice of inquiry. This was in the year 2000, um, and DOE was concerned about electric reliability. Um, and that was before Congress had given FERC explicit authority to address electric reliability. That was that came in 2005. And DOE put out a notice just sort of requesting comments from interested parties saying, look, we're, we're concerned about reliability. What should we do with it? There were seven questions they asked for comments on. One of them was simply, what can FERC do under existing authority to address reliability concerns? And you can imagine they could have taken a similar approach here with regard to resiliency, which is apparently what, what motivates uh, this proposal. That's not uh, the move that DOE took. They did something much more aggressive, uh, which is by actually proposing a rule uh, rather than uh, starting out by seeking input. So the, the NOPR instructs FERC to consider and take final action within 60 days. So I believe that puts us at it's December 9th or 10th, I think, for a final uh, FERC action on this, and it seems that FERC is taking this timeline very seriously. Um, numerous organizations waited immediately to ask for an extension. Uh, as, as everybody on this call knows, uh, the deadline is quite tight. It's quite unusual for FERC rules to have this tight of a deadline. And so there were a lot of extension requests, uh, and FERC uh, denied them uh, last week. It's important to keep in mind here that only FERC can finalize this proposal. DOE is, as a legal matter, out of things. Um, you know, may very well be playing a political role here, but but only FERC can can um, can deal with this proposal at this point. The ball is entirely uh, in FERC's FERC's court. So, what does the NOPR say? Well, the the NOPR purports to identify a problem, and I've put three quotes uh, from the NOPR up here. Uh, on the screen, and as I read it, it's sort of it, there, there's two distinct issues here um, that that DOE uh, seems to identify. One is this idea of premature retirements of fuel secure resources, um, and if you go back to the DOE staff report on electric reliability and markets, which came out just a few months ago, it acknowledges that identifying generator retirements that are premature is not a simple task and that it's highly subjective and largely depends on point of view. So for example, if you're a vertically integrated utility, you might think that a power plant that is that retires uh, you know, before it recovers its you know, rate-based capital investment, that might be a premature retirement from the vertically integrated utilities perspective. From a policymaker's perspective, you might think that a power plant that's still providing good jobs to the state and that has and that retires, maybe that's a premature retirement uh, you know, from, from the perspective of a policymaker. So premature is ambiguous in this rule, and it's not defined by DOE in this NOPR, and if this sort of what premature retirement means uh, is totally unaddressed. And of course, not all retirements are equal. Uh, you know, the NOPR doesn't provide any details on these retirements that it highlights. How often did these plants operate? 
Were they providing so-called essential reliability services? Were they operating as baseload plants or were, they, or were they sitting around, you know, in case of emergency, you know, totally unaddressed by the NOPR? Um, and of course, premature retirements only matter at all if they pose any risk to the grid. Um, and Paul's going to get into some of that, some of those details uh, with his presentation. The second uh, issue that it seems to identify here is that markets are not adequately pricing resiliency attributes. So that's a problem apparently with wholesale rates uh, because retirements themselves are not necessarily a problem. In fact, competitive markets are supposed to lead to retirement of inefficient resources. So you might look at retirements as a metric of success of markets, but if the NOPR identifies any problem with markets at all, it's that they're not adequately pricing uh, resiliency attributes to fuel secure generation resources. So that's, that's the issue that DOE uh, wants to address here. Um, so here's its proposed solution. And again, these are three quotes uh, from the NOPR itself. So ensure that these attributes are fully valued, ensure fair compensation. And the third point, um, you know, accurately price these resources. And if you just stop there, if you just look at those three phrases that I highlighted, full value, fair compensation, accurate pricing, you might think that DOE is headed towards some sort of market-based solution here. Um, but no, uh, that's apparently not the case. Um, so this is what, what the, what's in the proposed regulatory language that's in the very end, uh, the last page of the NOPR. Um, and if you look at Clause A, it says that this proposed uh, reliability and resiliency rate that each RTO has to offer, um, you know, it has to provide recovery of costs and return on equity. So that sounds a lot like cost of service regulation that, you know, states are, are very familiar with, um, not the sort of market-based construct that FERC has been operating for the past 20 years. Um, and then if you go to Part B, it's, it's a little confusing because it, at the end it says, you know, it talks about each eligible resource recovers its fully allocated costs and a fair return on equity. Again, this sounds a lot like cost of service, but if you go to the, 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 the beginning here, it talks about resource being fully compensated for the benefits and services it provides to grid operations. Um, so there we're talking about being compensated for benefits. Again, it sounds like they're, they're, they're trying to talk in the language of, of something that sounds more like a market. It actually sounds to me like they're talking about a sort of a something that, that reminds me of a value of solar tariff where at the distribution level, uh, you know, advocates of solar energy have been talking about valuing all of the various benefits that solar provides to the distribution grid and then setting a rate that's based on the value of those benefits. Um, you know, so if you want to be, you could potentially try to read that in here, but at the same time, it, 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 there's this language about fully recovering costs and return on equity that, that strongly suggests that what DOE wants here is simply, uh, you know, cost of service regulation, basically carving these resources in some sense out of the market-based construct and providing uh, cost of service rates for them. So then who's eligible for this special rate? Well, there's this, <laughs> One, they have to be located in RTO ISO, and this gets an asterisk here because incredibly uh, there was a change in the NOPR from when it was initially released until when it was actually published in the Federal Register. Um, it's a really material change that FERC said, FERC didn't even identify it, it just when it filed it um, in the docket, FERC simply said there are differences between the original version, didn't highlight those differences. So the, the key difference is now it, it, the rate only applies to resources and RTOs that have a capacity market. So that would be PJM, New York, ISO, and New England. Um, probably not MISO, as I understand it, has a, a, some sort of voluntary capacity market. Its, it's mandatory market was, was rejected earlier this year by FERC, so likely not ap applicable to MISO, although if MISO does uh, instituted capacity market in the future, I suppose this, if it, if it did get finalized, would apply to that region as well. Um, resources have to be able to provide certain essential reliability services, and, and then again, back to this fuel, fuel supply issue, a 90-day fuel supply on site, um, you know, no explanation for where this 90-day uh, requirement actually comes from. 
why it's 90, not 30, not 100, not a million is, is not explained. Um, but, you know, you could, you, could, you could read that a little more narrowly to say the 90-day fuel supply has to enable it to actually operate during an emergency. Um, so how you might define that and figure out whether or not the fuel supply actually allows it to operate in an emergency, given all the types of emergencies that might uh, make the coal pile too wet, for example. Um, totally undiscussed here. And then the last piece is that it's only to merchant plants. Um, so, so plants that are subject to state cost of service regulation, and there are many of them in, in PJM, um, you know, would, would not get this special rate. So that's, that's the basic uh, uh, gist of what the proposal is. It carves these resources out of the market in some fashion, although it doesn't describe exactly how they'll interact with the market, provides them with this rate that appears to be a cost of service rate, um, and, uh, and only to these specific uh, types of resources. So the legal deficiencies is what I've been focused on uh, since the proposal was released, and there's a real threshold legal deficiency that I think makes this uh, rule, if, if FERC were to finalize it, uh, really hard to defend. Um, and it has to do with Section 206 of the Federal Power Act, which is, how, which is the uh, source of authority for FERC rulemakings in the ordinary uh, course of things. And what that section says is FERC can establish just and reasonable rates, but only if it first concludes that current rates are not just and reasonable. So it's a two-step process for these sorts of rules that apply to all market operators. FERC has to conclude that the current rules are resulting in rates that are unjust and unreasonable, and then FERC sets a rule uh, that will result in just and reasonable rates. And if you go back and look at the NOPERS about previous market rules, um, they all include some proposed finding saying that rates are un currently unjust and unreasonable, or there's a danger that rates will become unjust and unreasonable, and then FERC has some explanation explaining that finding. And that's totally absent here. So not only is there no explicit finding, there's really, it's really hard to find any meaningful statement at all about deficiencies in current rates. And to the extent that it's there, it's about resiliency pricing or the lack of resiliency pricing uh, that I mentioned before. But incredibly, DOE does not define the word resiliency here, and that's no small matter. Um, this is not a word that FERC has ever connected to wholesale rates before. It's come up a couple times in FERC proceedings, but it has to do with NERC reliability standards, in particular the physical security of facilities, which really doesn't seem to connect quite clearly to wholesale rates. So there's really, not only is there sort of no specific finding, but there's no really, um, any sort of meaningful explanation at all about what's wrong with wholesale rates. And that's a problem uh, because it's sort of central to the entire scheme of how the Federal Power Act operates, that FERC can only um, act when rates are unjust and unreasonable. And it's a general problem under fe federal administrative law because when an agency, when any agency, whether it's DOE or FERC or anyone else, uh, put out a proposed rule, the whole point of that is to provide interested parties with an opportunity to comment meaningfully. And when you omit a central aspect uh, of the rule, you're not really providing an opportunity for meaningful comment. So as I said, we, we submitted a just a four-page comment on this issue saying basically uh, this deficiency dooms the entire effort here, um, and FERC's really only option is to just reject uh, reject the NOPER. And so that's in the docket now, and if anybody wants to I'm happy to email that to people as well if, if that's something they want to see. But let's say FERC does finalize this rule. Um, a couple other legal issues that I'll talk about. One, you know, is the rule unduly discriminatory? Um, you know, no, no wholesale rate under the Federal Power Act rates may not be unduly discriminatory. So there's sort of two issues you might think about here. One, this whole 90-day fuel supply issue. Is that unduly discriminatory? Why are we supplying a special rate? just for those resources. It looks not, not the kind of thing that FERC has ever done before. Does that discriminate against other resources? Maybe not on that point. Um, and this is a quote here, the second bullet um, from a recent DC Circuit decision. Nothing in applicable law requires a rate standard to result in no disparate impact on any power resource whatsoever. At issue in that case was PJM's capacity market. And the new rules in the capacity market uh, require that resources make annual commitments to be, be available at any point in the year. This uh, was a change because previously the capacity market allowed for seasonal commitments because some resources demand response, for example, that relies on, let's say, air conditioning load is better in the summer. Uh, solar is typically better in the summer. So um, certain resources are seasonal and, and, and a group 
uh, you know, claimed in the lawsuit that this was undue, that this annual requirement was unduly discriminatory, but the court said, look, FERC had a real purpose here. There was a real difference between resources that could provide an annual commitment as compared to those resources that could only provide a seasonal commitment. That was a, an actual difference, and so it was a basis to discriminate that was not unduly discriminatory. Um, but the other issue then here is notes FERC's also discriminating between merchant plants and cost of service plants. Um, that seems a little more troubling to me. Um, but again, uh, you know, the, the Federal Power Act prohibits undue discrimination only when entities are similarly situated. That's been a flexible term. Uh, the whole undue discrimination standard has been very flexible over the years. And so if FERC has a reason basis for discrimination, it might not be undue. So this is this will be, you know, if, if this war, rule were finalized, this would certainly be an issue. I don't think it's a home run for opponents of the rule. And then the last legal issue I'll, I'll briefly mention is, is this all going to be arbitrary and capricious? You know, I've, I've sort of, and Paul's going to get into a whole bunch of, of, of substantive issues with the rule. Um, and so, you know, based on all the things that Paul is going to tell you, you could say, well, th this is totally arbitrary and capricious. There's just no basis for, for um, finalizing this rule. And, and that's really something you have to convince FERC about, and you have to load up the record with, with those facts, as Paul is doing, because once FERC makes a judgment based on the record, courts are very deferential to FERC's technical policy and particularly its rate-making judgments. And that's, I would imagine that's true in, in state courts in, in the states that you're in as well. Um, you know, once regulators um, decide that, you know, these resources really are important for resiliency and that they can point to some basis in the record, even if you disagree with it, as long as there's some facts in the record to support their conclusions on these technical and rate-making matters, it's very rare to see uh, a court overturn it on those grounds. And maybe this would be potentially, a, uh, you know, an exception to that rule because, you know, this is just so unlike anything that FERC has ever proposed before, but this is really an uphill battle to get a court to overturn a FERC rule on arbitrary and capricious grounds. Um, so what are FERC options from here? Well, there's a chance, you know, FERC could simply finalize the NOPR. We have two commissioners right now. Uh, sorry, excuse me, three commissioners. You'll, so you only need two uh, votes for this to actually uh, go through. Uh, but here, there's some recent comments by the three commissioners that suggest that they're not going to approve this. But again, you never know. Um, and, you know, they still have you know, 45 days or so before their deadline, and so their minds can change. But these are all quotes that they recently said, Pallison, we will not destroy the marketplace. FERC does not do energy politics. L Commissioner LaFleur then retweeted that. Does her retweet equal an endorsement? I don't know. Um, she said, great message. Um, more recently, there's a utility dive article that went up yesterday where she basically suggested some of the deficiencies that I've talked about, that this doesn't really provide a proper basis for a final rule. So she seems to be leaning against it. And even Neil Chatterjee, who had made some very positive comments about coal when he was first uh, sworn into FERC, very unusual for a FERC uh, commissioner to make those sorts of comments. Um, he says he wants to correct market deficiencies uh, in a legally defensible manner that doesn't blow up the markets. Uh, so, you know, perhaps, uh, you know, subtweeting Department of Energy on that one. So what, and then he's laid out what are some options if FERC doesn't approve it, it could, it could just come up with a new NOPR based on the record uh, that's being developed now. It could issue a, a notice of inquiry, you know, basically the sort of thing that DOE did in 2000 about reliability, just ask some very high level questions about re resiliency and figure out where to go from there. Um, it could host a technical conference or request additional comments. This is the sort of thing that happens very often in, in, in FERC rules as well. So, or FERC could just abandon this effort entirely and go about its business and continue its efforts on price formation that had been underway uh, for the past um, several years. So I'm going to stop there. I'll look forward to uh, Paul's presentation and then uh, hearing, hearing your questions. Great. Thanks so much, Ari. Let's, let's give Paul the control of the screen. All right, when we come back to the q and A, I'd be curious, you filed the short piece with FERC that said the notice uh, what failed to indicate there was a deficiency. Would a new NOPR, a new NOPR could from FERC could presumably correct that, is that right? Yeah, they, FERC could start the process over and correct that. That's right. How you doing, Paul, you ready to go? Oh, we can't hear you, so you might be on mute. 
My apologies. Can you hear me now? No worries. It's all yours, Paul. All right, Go great. For it. Great. Well, good afternoon, everybody. And, and first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Franz and, and, and Sarah and the Great Plains Institute and, and the Nicholas Institute at Duke for uh, the kind invitation to come and uh, you know, speak to you all about the, uh, the DOE NOPER. And um, you know, as Ari already previewed, Ari, Ari's taking care of the, all of the legal issues that uh, if I were a lawyer, which thank God I'm not, um, because I would be a very poor lawyer, uh, I would have hit on many of the same points. But let me go ahead and talk about some of the, the market and reliability implications of of this. So, you know, as as we all know, there's this issue about retirements of so-called fuel secure resources. Well, if we think about what's happened in PJM since the start of 2010, there have been just north of 26,000 megawatts of generation retirements. There are currently pending another 12,000 plus retirements. Uh, that are going to happen between now and 2020. So overall, we're talking about 38,000 megawatts of retirements. Uh, what I've, I'm showing you here is just sort of the evolution of cleared installed capacity um, in, in the PJM markets. And, and as you can see, at least to date, um, assume, you know, taking into account that all of the retirements that are pending have been accounted for in the 2020-2021 uh, base residual auction, we're still talking about you know, nearly 40,000 megawatts of unforced capacity of coal that's still going to remain in the market. So in some sense, the rumors of coal's death has been greatly exaggerated, uh, paraphrasing Mark Twain, but certainly gas is taking over and, you know, we've heard all the issues with nuclear and so on. But this just gives you a sense of what perhaps uh, DOE has pointed to in its, in its NOPER um, proposal. But the issue really comes down to what is, and let me get rid of this, um, there we go, uh, so everybody can see this. So what is the issue really with reliability? Well, the DOE NOPR is totally silent on the fact that PJM and other RTOs, and I'm focusing on PJM1 because we're the PJM states on the call primarily, but secondly, about 90% of the affected generation capacity from this rule resides in PJM. And so this, this rule seems to be very targeted toward PJM to Ari's point about the change between uh, the NOPA released on September 29th and uh, the Federal Register notice that all of a sudden capacity markets became an issue really sort of screams that this is, this is, high, this is really targeted toward one, maybe two uh, specific RTOs uh, in particular, um, MISO being another one of those RTOs because uh, New England doesn't have any coal and New York has, has but one you know, in-name coal unit uh, remaining in commercial operation. Um, <clears throat> so under Part 5 of the tariff, reliability is already handled. When a unit uh, files for a deactivation or retirement, there's a reliability study that's done within 30 days of the retirement notice. If there's a problem, uh, PJM will provide, that, pro provide notice of that problem, um, and then we'll try to come up with uh, reliability solutions uh, if that can't be developed in time to allow the unit to retire when it wants to, uh, PJM can offer a reliability must-run contract to keep the unit in service, which pays it, basically pays it its cost of service for uh, any remaining cost that it would incur but for uh, the fact that it's, it's not retiring, uh, which doesn't mean it gets to recover sunk costs necessarily. Um, and then you know, plus some adders to provide at least some, some profit, if you will, to keep the unit in operation. Once that's done, once the solution is in place, then uh, the unit can go ahead and retire. Uh, to give you some context, um, out of the, the 26,000 megawatts that have already retired and the other 12,000 uh, in, uh, in the queue to retire, we're talking about five RMR contracts overall across plants. I mean, affected units, we're talking about 12 affected units at five different facilities. And my apologies for not getting that in here in the slides, but, but if you place that in context, that, that accounts for maybe 2,000 megawatts out of 38,000 megawatts in which an RMR was needed. But if we think about the RMRs, if a unit chooses not to take an RMR, which has happened, PJM has also come up with special operating procedures um, 
to go ahead and allow the unit to retire as requested so that reliability can be maintained uh, in the interim. Uh, and we've seen some of that as well. So PJM has a lot of options available to handle reliability issues related to retirements already. So did the other RTOs. Uh, all the other RTOs have similar um, procedures uh, outlined in their tariff. But the reliability issues that we're talking about are not the quote unquote fuel security issues, nor are they necessarily the quote unquote essential reliability services um, issues. A lot of them are related to transmission uh, issues. So transmission overloads, um, if a unit retires and it was providing counterflow on transmission, uh, then possibly we would have to expand the transmission system and, and upgrade uh, the circuits so that it could handle more power flow. The other common issue that comes up are voltage conditions where units are in, in a place where they're providing reactive power support for the system. And, and absent those units, uh, solutions would have to go in place to uh, provide reactive power solutions such as capacitor banks, static VAR compensators, uh, or even synchronous condensing capability um, to, to uh, address the voltage issues. Generally, the voltage issues, such as the ones that I mentioned, are relatively quick and inexpensive solutions to the voltage problem. Um, the, the reliability issues, if you go and look at the NOPER about, that mentions essential reliability services, things like frequency response and reserves, have nothing to do with the reliability issue here, and I'll show you why uh, in a few slides. So, uh, if, before if, you um, uh, go on, we had just a clarifying question. Can you um, just explain what an RMR is for anyone who doesn't have that on the, the tip of their tongue? RMR is reliability must run agreement. It's basically a contract to keep the unit in service until the reliability solution come, is placed in the service. Does that help, Sarah? Um, I hope so. <laughs> All right, very good. So <clears throat> I'm going to get to the punchline. DOE, as part of its NOPER, is asserting unequivocally and, and ironically enough with a document that's not even open to the public domain from NERC. Um, if one reads the NOPER, there's this letter from Jerry Cauley uh, at NERC on May 9th to the, to the Secretary of Energy. <clears throat> that, has not heretofore been a matter of public record, although it's been leaked uh, in some uh, trade press articles. Uh, but NERC has not actually released that letter to my knowledge. Um, and what's interesting is that there's assertions made about the so-called fuel secure baseload resources that they supply all of these wonderful essential reliability services. Uh, and without them, reliability will be jeopardized. And, you know, we're going to have all kinds of other issues. Well, let's, let's think about this. Um, the, the short answer to the reliability problem is there is none. There's one more to reliability than essential reliability services, as I think we all understand, is, and that one is resource adequacy. And so I, I would submit to you that in the last base residual auction, in spite of all of the retirements that have taken place, PJM has cleared at an installed reserve margin of 23.2%. That is the all-time highest reserve margin cleared since the implementation of the reliability pricing model in 2007. From a resource adequacy standpoint, there are no issues. The system is incredibly long, and that doesn't include resources that did not clear an RPM, but yet remain in commercial operation, of which there is a considerable amount. And so <clears throat> when we're starting to look at this, this, this reserve margin, resource adequacy, not a problem. As I'll show you in a little bit, winter performance, is not is, is improving. I mean, the polar vortex is cited early and often in the DOE doper, but I'm going to show you some information that, one, the, uh, we can see that uh, the information that's out there is, is actually misrepresented, I would argue, um, that it's actually quite different than fuel security. It's really uh, just operational issues. The other issue is that fleet performance is improving overall, <clears throat> excuse me, since capacity performance uh, has been implemented and proposed. And then finally, on the essential reliability service issues, especially with respect to frequency response and regulation, um, the so-called uh, fuel secure baseload resources provide very little reserves and frequency response. In fact, nuclear units can't provide reserves and can't provide frequency response because if they're running, they're running full out unless they're ramping up from an outage or coasting down to, a, to an outage, such as a refueling outage. <clears throat> 
um, all generators of any type, it doesn't matter, are providing voltage support at this point in time, so that's not even an issue. So with that, let's look at the polar vortex one more time. Um, I, I've thrown this up here. This is, we've probably all seen this pie chart uh, quite a bit. 40,000 megawatts on the worst day in, during the polar vortex during the first week of January in 2014, a 22% forced outage rate. Um, the earth was crashing into the sun. But I will let you know that there was no lost load. There was no firm load shed during the polar vortex. In fact, to, to emphasize that point, for those of you who have seen the Rhodium Group report on this going through, through DOE data, 0.00007% of all loss of load events were due to lack of fuel. And that was a coal unit in Minnesota from what I understand, as the vast majority of that. In, in the last several years. So effectively, even if there are fuel issues, it's not leading to a loss of load uh, event because there are other resources available. But I digress. So thinking about this, what, what's the largest category you see on this pie chart? It's not gas, it's not gas for lack of fuel, it's actually coal outages. Coal units that had either frozen coal piles, frozen conveyors, uh, other issues at the facility that could not operate. If you take a look at that combined with nuclear and gas plant outages, um, nuclear accounted for uh, 1,400 megawatts, I believe that was uh, the Calvert Cliffs unit uh, that was out. And then you take the 9,700 megawatts of gas plant outages, which were really mostly dual fuel facilities that had start failures. So if you start including those, all of those I would consider fuel secure, and the fuel secure outages during the polar vortex were 62% of all of the outages. Let that sink in for a moment. 62% of the outages during the polar vortex were for resources that could be considered because they had fuel on site, fuel secure. Whereas only a mere 23% of the outages were due to gas interruptions. So in citing the polar vortex, this doesn't really support DOE's notion that there is a fuel security issue and fuel security would save us from these, these problems because if the fuel secure resources had operated, we probably wouldn't even be having this conversation. Now what's happened since? Well, after the winter of 2014, for those, who, for those of you who are all familiar, PJM initiated in May of 2014 the capacity performance a stakeholder process and then filed late in the year for changes that uh, eventually resulted in, in FERC approval uh, for capacity performance. The whole idea behind capacity performance, which in essence was a um, basically copying what New England did with pay for, pay for performance, is that there are effectively no excuses for non-performance, period. Um, with a couple of minor exceptions in PJM, there are no excuses. If you don't perform, you're subject to extremely large penalties. Well, a funny thing happened in the winter of 2015 after this was proposed, and, and prior to capacity performance being approved, it was certainly coming down the pike. The worst winter day in, in 2015 was in February. In fact, the weather was about the same as it was during the polar vortex, but the peak load was even higher I want that to sink in too. The peak load in 2015 was even higher than the peak load in winter peak load in 2014 during the polar vortex. And yet, performance, generator performance was considerably improved over that. Again, I'm showing this up here, coal accounting for, again, the largest majority of outages. And then if you start taking into account coal and nuclear and, and, and everything else that we're talking about, again, a very large amount, I mean, a very large amount of outages due to fuel secure resources. In fact, close to 60%. Natural gas interruptions were down the next 30%. So again, does fuel secure save us from a, a, a huge weather event like this? Likely no. And then in the winter of 2016, again, we see performance improving. One could argue that the winter of 2016 was much milder, so we don't see a lot of the same issues that we would see otherwise. 
But again, all this does is reinforce the trend, even in the absence of an extreme weather event. On the coldest day, on the winter peak day in PJM, coal is the largest source of outages in the footprint. And again, we see you know, some nuclear derates thrown in there, some other start failures on gas plant uh, outages. But again, when push comes to shove, more than 60%, in fact, about 70% of the outages in winter 2016 on the peak day were due to so called to do what I would consider fuel secure resources, those that had fuel on site. I'm not even going to get into the 90 day issue because there's been no um, reason to, to show that. So even if I have 90 days of fuel on site with these coal units, if they couldn't run for some reason, the best thing you can do is look at the cold weather from the top of the coal pile in the yard. What a view that would be. So we know that there's we, we, we know that there's you know in the context of, of winter peak issues there's no issue there's no uh, performance issue but let's think about the, the assertions that uh, oh my god gas resources are so unreliable and, and things of that nature so let's look at the history of generator performance in PGM these are forced outage rates taken from the state uh, from uh, one of the quarterly state of the market reports I have not updated this slide I apologize uh, to account for full year 2016 but basically the story here is nuclear has pretty low forced outage rates. I think that that's a, that's a reasonable assertion to make. Uh, nuclear performance overall since restructuring and wholesale competition has improved greatly from what it was 20 years ago. Um, but if you look at fossil resources, what's the lowest forced outage rate among fossil resources? Combined cycle natural gas. Combined cycle natural gas which is what's being built today in PJM. It accounts for essentially all of the new entry in PJM. We're looking at forced outage rate at 4% or less, whereas fossil steam units, which includes not just coal steam, coal units, but also oil steam and gas steam units, have been 10% or greater for many years. And so all one has to do is, is think about this. Well, if gas units, combined cycle units are replacing coal units, and the combined cycle units have lower forced outage rates than the coal units, one can only conclude that reliability is actually improving with the turnover in the, in the fleet as opposed to actually getting worse, which is the conjecture in the DOE NOPR. So what does that mean for overall fleet performance? Again, I'm, I'm cribbing from uh, my apologies to, to Joe Bowering and monitoring analytics. I didn't get the credit in here. This was taken directly out of the 2016 State of the Market Report. Um, uh, from monitoring analytics. And I, I would note to you that overall, prior to the polar vortex event and prior to capacity performance, the overall fleet-wide performance in PJM has actually gotten steadily worse over time. Now, there are a variety of reasons for that, but if you think about it, we didn't start seeing a bevy of coal retirements until 2010-2011. Forced outage rates were actually quite high on a fleet-wide basis. Then we have the polar vortex in 2014, and then we have the proposal for capacity performance. The fleet-wide performance since then has improved dramatically, as you can see from, this, from the data provided by monitoring analytics. One could say it's just correlation and not causality, but it's really funny how we reached a point where now units really have to perform, otherwise they could get heavily penalized, and all of a sudden generator performance goes down. I don't think it's just a coincidence. I think there's a lot there. The other thing I would point out here too is that uh, according to data provided by monitoring analytics going through the GADS data uh, from PJM units, a lack of fuel only accounts for less than 1% of total forced, outage, forced outages in PJM. There are plenty of other reasons generators are forced out. Lack of fuel is just simply not a big contributor in any sense to generator outages, let alone the possibility of a, of a uh, of lo firm load shed. What about the essential reliability services? Um, for those of you who are not familiar with the PJM markets, there are two types of synchronized reserve, Tier 1 and Tier 2. Tier 1 synchronized reserve are provided by units 
that are already online and operating and have headroom available and are counted toward providing reserves to meet the largest contingency, which could be the loss of the largest generator or a large transmission asset. The remaining synchronized reserves to meet the requirements are met by Tier 2 synchronized reserves for which there is a market. Uh, the assertion uh, in, in the DOE NOPER and, and citing again the NERC letter that these, these so-called fuel secure baseload resources are, are huge contributors to essential reliability services such as ramping, reserves are a part of ramping here, um, is not borne out by the data whatsoever, at least for the, in the context of PJM. And what we see is, is the largest category of, of Tier 2 synchronized reserves are combustion turbines. CTs that are actually can be placed into synchronous condensing mode and can be immediately brought online in the snap of a finger, if you could hear that over the phone, I'm snapping my fingers, and they can actually be up and running. What's ironic is that in terms of the Tier 2 synchronized reserves, if one looks at one of the lowest categories in the light blue uh, series, which I know is very hard to see in this slide, are steam units, which includes coal. What, uh, what else provides a lot of uh, uh, synchronized reserve. One of the other large categories is demand response, providing a lot of Tier 2 reserve. So this idea that we have to have these, these large, big baseload units for reserves or for ramping capability just is not borne out from what we see in the data here. Moreover, notice what's missing, no nuclear. Nuclear doesn't provide synchronized reserve. Nuclear is either running full out or it's coasting down to an outage or ramping up from an outage. They're not providing any reserves or ramping capability to the system whatsoever. How about regulation and frequency response? Again, uh, monitoring analytics and the state of the market report provides some fabulous information. Uh, again, my kudos to Joe Bowering and his team for, for doing all of this, for putting this all out here. Again, if one takes a look at this table, the largest source of, of regulation and frequency response from generation units it's not from coal. Obviously, nuclear is not on here. It's from natural gas resources. And those natural gas resources that are providing that are not CTs. Those are actually being provided by combined cycle units, providing regulation and frequency response. The next biggest category are batteries, followed by hydro. In other words, coal steam units are not providing a whole lot of regulation here. And if one takes a look even deeper in the state of the market report, the, the performance of coal units in providing regulation and following the base point signal accurately and quickly is actually far less than that of natural gas units and batteries. So they're actually better at providing regulation service than, uh, than would coal steam units. So again, in response to the conjecture that we, we need these units for essential reliability services, the argument simply doesn't hold up. The data do not bear that out whatsoever. So, there's the reliability argument. Now, I'm an economist, and I haven't even gotten to talking about markets yet. Shame on me. But I think it's pretty clear, and, and we, could, we could walk through all of the arguments here, is that the proposal, no matter how it's implemented, is going to create distortions and inefficiencies and higher costs. I think one of the things that Ari has pointed out, and I think that it's just a glaring omission in the NOPER, and, and one of many fatal flaws, in my opinion, is that while there's the, the need in the regulatory language for full cost recovery, fully allocated cost recovery, and so on, there is no plan to implement this. There is no proposed rate. There is no implementation details in any way, shape, or form in the NOPER. So it's impossible to tell exactly what's going to happen here. But I can imagine two possible options. The first option is that that this could be implemented as a megawatt hour adder, uh, like a PTC or a REC or a ZEC or a ZEN or MOUSE, if you will. In either case, one could imagine a solution where the megawatt hour adder is so large that these units would operate in many, the coal units in particular, nuclear units are already running full out anyway, but the coal units in particular would want to run at zero prices or even negative prices, much like we've seen with wind. 
right now today these coal units are actually more expensive to run than combined cycle gas generators. So we're actually going to distort the market if in this kind of implementation by having coal units effectively running at zero, getting an adder so they run full out, displacing more efficient resources. But from a price formation perspective, it will look like in the wholesale market energy prices are lower and not higher. But those costs have to be made up for somewhere. And so they're going to be done non-transparently through bills in the wholesale market in some way that has yet to be defined or defined at all in the NOPR. Does it get imposed on the entire PJM footprint? Just those areas that have retail choice? What happens to cost of service states within the PJM footprint that have already paid for units? Do they have to pay for the market units too? These are all totally unaddressed and unanswered questions, and of course that would distort a lot of the incentives in the market as well. Of course, in a situation like that, the capacity market will be distorted. We'll be seeing a potentially lower cost and, and more efficient units being, uh, being pushed out of the market uh, by more expensive units. Uh, it could also be implemented as an additional capacity payment, leaving economic dispatch as it is, and, and just as an additional capacity payment, which will clearly distort the capacity market in much the same way that we've talked about with, with a lot of subsidies, uh, various state subsidies, but also that'll have spillover effects back into the energy market again. Um, so there are different ways of looking at this. Either way, it's not going to be good. And who gets to bear the cost? We have no idea. So we have a price formation issue. FERC has talked about price formation. The NOPA even talks about price formation. But what's being proposed by the NOPA would actually harm price formation, actually make it much more non-transparent than it is today. Uh, we're going to suppress prices in the markets. The headline prices will be lower, but the actual cost to customers are going to be higher. <laughs> and we can see inefficient exit of resources. And I haven't put it here on this slide, but the, MOP, the NOPR is, I said, almost said NOPR. Um, I still wear the scars from that, unfortunately. But the NOPR itself doesn't even talk about who's even eligible for such payments, except to say so-called fuel secure resources. It says nothing about whether the resources must be in commercial operation today or whether we could bring back resources that have already retired because they're going to get cost of service payments plus a rate of return the incentive would be to bring back a lot of these retired coal units, install pollution controls to make them mass compliant so that they could get all of this money. In fact, they could make a lot of money on the investment in pollution controls alone under such a scenario. That's not the kind of incentives that we want. Markets are supposed to incentivize innovation and cost cutting, not actually increasing costs, which is what would happen here. <clears throat> so I want to leave you with what from with some takeaways from the PJ and Clean Power Plan study. And you're probably thinking, well, what does this have to do with the DOE NOPR? Bear with me, because there are some scenarios that were run that are actually very telling here. Um, so what I'm put up here is just sort of the gas prices that were, were used in the PJ and Clean Power Plan study. And what I want to focus on are the low gas price scenarios, the, the IHS scenario in green, um, which are the scenarios I'm going to address. If you one looks at the forward curve, not even from a, a year ago, but, but the current one, gas prices are forecast to remain pretty low for the foreseeable future, uh, forgetting about the uh, EIA forecast. But if one just takes a look at market expectations, uh, gas prices are going to remain low for quite some time uh, at this point. And so in that scenario, there, were, there was one scenario where firms took a short-term view and in that scenario, 14 gigawatts of nuclear retired in PJM and, and another large chunk of, of resources retired in um, uh, coal resources retired in that scenario. And that's in the dot, blue dotted line, uh, dotted series on both of these graphs in the slide that I'm showing you. And then there's a, just a low gas price scenario where people took a long-term view and there would be even more coal retirements. So one way to think about the cost and a lower bound estimate of the cost at that would be to think in order just to prevent these retirements, 
forgetting about the incentives to bring back units that have already retired. Forget about rates of return, the cost of keeping extra coal in inventory. I'm not even getting into that. Just covering the going forward cost of the units that would retire in these PJM scenarios would be, sorry, I'm skipping slides here, would be approximately 4.5 billion per year in the high nuclear retirement case. That would add approximately $5.70 per megawatt hour to PJM wholesale costs alone. In other words, it would, it would effectively increase capacity costs, if that's how they were done, by 70%. I'll let that sink in. For what would be effectively, I would argue, no reliability benefit. In, the, in the, the scenario where we have no nuclear retirements but a lot of coal going away, which would be low gas prices with a long-term view, it would still be as much as 1.75 billion. And again, we're only talking about the going forward cost. We're not talking about the rates of return on any sunk investments of units that are still in service. We're not talking about uh, units being brought back from the dead, the zombie units, to feed on the subsidies. That would cost extra money, not only for their going forward costs, but also capital investments to make them environmentally compliant not for the cost of inventory capital to keep 90 days of coal in the yard. Most of these units keep between 60 and 75 days of coal in the yard, not 90 days. What's magical about 90 days? Unless it's designed to help coal companies. Cost allocation isn't addressed. So we're affected being replaced by, as I mentioned before, combined cycle gas. And again, if we're gonna swap out coal for combined cycle gas from a reliability standpoint and a forced outage standpoint, that's a winner from a reliability standpoint. So I'm going to conclude there. Uh, there's a lot of other issues that we could get into, um, but if there are any questions, I, I've got my email and, and phone numbers. Uh, I encourage you to reach out to me um, if you would like, uh, and I hope this is helpful, and I look forward to your questions. And again, thank you for the invitation.